Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Once again, Janet Draka, a good friend of the Sangha. She's been, been here uh, many times. Uh, 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 her official name is uh, Jinjetsu Sensei, uh, I believe. Uh, she receives a Dharma transmission in the Soto Zen Buddhist lineage from Sensei Blanche Hardman, uh, uh, who was the first woman in this lineage. Actually, the second. I this meant to talk oh. about that. She was the second. Yeah. She was the second. Okay, yeah. so Sensei. Uh, yeah, uh, Janet uh, uh, runs uh, a nonprofit organization called Janet Rackers Community Services, and which provides a large range of services, including support groups, workshops, classes, and talks. Uh, her community work uh, is based on harm reduction principles, a way to meet everyone with complete acceptance, and allows for a client-centered modality. Among her many activities, Jana leads a meditation group at Light Memorial on Monday evenings, facilitates an ongoing peer support group for case managers at the Tenderloin Housing Clinic, where she runs a mindfulness group and a grief and stress support group that gives one-on-one -on -one counseling to staff and clients. And uh, she has a website that uh, she can mention later on. So <laughs> my pleasure to introduce and welcome you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here and see all of my old friends again, all my brothers. Um, yes, it, it, it's not I that's picky about the Dharma ancestor thing, but there is someone rather <coughs> high up who every time that gets put online on, on, on the web calls me repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> who was the person? Catherine Thanos is her name, and she passed on a wee while ago. Um, because as you probably know, uh, when the tradition came over from you know, India, China, Japan, when it came into America, then women could be ordained, fully ordained monks. So yes, my teacher was a second woman in that part of the lineage. And, um, I'm actually the first um, gender fluid Dharma ancestor. I don't particularly identify as female. I mean, I don't particularly identify as anything, actually. <laughs> Which is the subject of today's talk. Um, as you know, I don't write the talks, so that, that half hour of sitting right before the talk is always kind of exciting, because I'm busy trying not to plan what I'm going to say. Because you might know that anything you are doing, anything that is part of your belief, 
belief system that you bring into everyday life is actually a barrier to experiencing fully everyday life. And I was very interested, a few months ago you had a speaker who stirred up a lot of, um, it seemed like, dispute amongst the, the fellowship. Um, I've never seen so many, there were lots of email conversation around it. Um, people say, well, if that's how life is, I might as well kill myself now. <laughs> Someone else say, well, if that's how life is, I'll just have to party on. <laughs> and that's the trouble with definitions. I mean, um, Alan Watts, he, he says, uh, you know, ignore... Oh, in fact, I have it right here. Very fond. I have Alan Watts and Rumi and Walt Whitman with me today. Um, let's see. This is Alan Watts. He says, what, what we're missing is we're forever caught up in thought, forever going on with what's in our minds, forever being dragged around by our, our emotions. And he says, this is what we're missing. The unthinkable ingenuity and creative power of our spontaneous and natural functioning, which is blocked by our usual thought patterns. So... How do we uh, escape from that? Because it's those usual thought patterns that all relate back to me that cause the suffering. I'm like this, I need that in my life, and this is how it is, and if it doesn't go that way, I'm going to be upset, and if it goes that way, I'll be happy. Pre-thinking, 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 pre-thinking. So um, how do we get free I mean, I wanted to say something before y'all started meditating, <laughs> but I miscommunicated and, and it didn't happen. Um, I say that's because of my accent. You communicated fine, it was my thought processes that were... Got in the way, absolutely. <laughs> it's like I was going to the hospital a few weeks ago and there was a man outside and I said, is this x-ray? And he went, ashtray? <laughs> and we did that a few more times actually, 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 and then I just and then I apologise for my accent my apologies for the time <laughs> it's been interesting you know leaving the traditional Zen training and being out on the streets and trying to see how do you make kind of deep teachings available and useful to everybody and recently I, I've had a great challenge with that because I've been asked to take this kind of meditation I teach, Zaza and just sitting, into um, all of Tenderloin Housing Clinic, which is a big place that um, has 16 SRO hotels where I already do memorials. And they're calling it three at three, pause. I believe they're taking it into the school district soon. So they asked me to come in and, and take it on. And I thought, well, I wish I'd been there at the planning stages. And when I got to meet everybody, I realised I was there at the planning stages. They had a nice little pamphlet, unfortunately, with people with their eyes shut, which for me is a big no-no, um, and talking about we're all going to take a pause at three, but they had no idea what that would consist of. <laughs> so my challenge was to come up with something that would immediately be teachable to people. And, for example, one of the first gigs I had was on last Wednesday, and I had 15 maintenance men uh, in a very tiny little office, and most of them didn't know me. And there I walk in, this strange person with a shaved head, and everybody's saying she, and they're all kind of looking at me. And, you know, it was really odd, you know. So what could I do in 15 minutes for the maintenance workers in an SRO hotel. And what's been working really, really well lately, as you know, I'm not stuck on one way. Uh, if I was, I'd be the antithesis of what I'm talking about. Um, Tibetan practice. There's this great, 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 very easy to do Tibetan practice that you can do all the time. You don't have to be staring at the wall. You certainly don't want to close your eyes. But it's a way of coming away from all that realm of thought, not stopping it. You know, fine, if you start arguing with what's going on in your mind, it's just making it worse. So just to get your attention away from that and to right here, 
This is a fantastic practice. So everybody, we're going to try it right now, and it only takes a moment. You don't have to do. You don't have to sit anywhere special. You don't have to get all. By the way, get comfortable. If you're not comfortable, please be comfortable. I saw you fall off a couple of times. <laughs> 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 Although I never did it myself. Some of these cushions are like sitting on bricks. You know, like, oh. <laughs> so it's very, very, very simple. It's simply awareness of breath, but it's really physical. So I want everybody right now just to see where's the breath coming in. Is it the mouth, the nose? Okay, and you can follow it in. And then you can follow it back out again. Now try really hard not to close your eyes. I know that's a habit, but we're talking about being able to do this, say, in the middle of an argument. Someone's coming at you. You become present. And you're no longer dragged around by things. Now that's actually it. We can all go home now. <laughs> <laughs> if you can follow just simply three of those breaths, that's a Tibetan practice called Sumpa. And it's a very, very effective way to get yourself away from all this blah, 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 the running commentary that we have in life. And back to right here. And begin to trust that you right here without all of this stuff is just quite perfect. So we're training ourselves. You know, it's said in, for example, how many people know the Heart Sutra? Oh, dear me, we'll have to do the Heart Sutra sometime. <laughs> the Heart Sutra contains all the essential teachings of Buddhism. And it's very much to do with knocking us off our usual thought patterns. Because those usual thought patterns are actually what gets in the way. I mean, I often give the example of um, if a thought book comes to mind, that's fine, that's quite peaceful, doesn't disturb anything. If the thought book comes to mind, oh, I remember a book I had years ago, I wonder what I did with it, I'm so stupid, I'm always losing things. That's following a thought. So there's nothing disturbing about things coming to mind. It's then we, the big eye, jumps in and starts interfering with it and making it how we think it should be, which of course is a silly thing to do because, you know, when did it ever work out that way? <laughs> I was thinking about this arguing over who's got it right, who, who knows how to define these things. You know, most of us have probably spent a lot of time in our lives wondering why are we here, you know, what's it for? What happens after we die? You know, like really, really basic questions. And I too spent years of my life trying to figure that out. I wanted to know. I wanted the answer. I wanted to be right and have the answer and then I would be kind of safe, you know. And after many years I realized that what's wonderful to know is the great mystery, you know. You can't argue with people over a mystery. Mm -hmm. And how on earth can we actually ever see what we're about because we're part of all this? We can't think of ourselves as something separate. That's, well, you don't know the Heart Sutra, but it does say that, you know, we are not separate from each other. We are so united to each other that it's impossible to just start thinking of me, 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 me. Um, what came to mind when I was thinking on this, and this one, as you know, just inspiration comes through. It's like being a drain pipe or a TV aerial or something. And this one actually happened because um, I was sitting looking at my window. And I was thinking, on a Yoko Ono song came to mind. Who remembers Yoko Ono? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's better than the Heart Sutra. <laughs> And she, um, if you remember a song she did, um, and mostly her songs, as you might recall, were pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> you remember John Lennon, had to, he produced an LP, and he, he, it was supposed to be one side was his songs and the other side was her, but he knew nobody had listened to her, so he intermingled them, so you had to listen to them. <laughs> anyway, the one that kept coming up, and I was looking out my window, and I'll sing it for you. Who has seen the wind? Neither you nor I. But when the trees bow down their heads, 
the wind is passing by. And that made me think of the life force. Whatever the heck you want to call it. Spirit, soul, chi, whatever. You know, The fact is that these bodies are the vehicles we're living in. And sure, they've got lots of problems and things happen and it's going to go at some point and doesn't function so well, you know, every now and then. But that's simply the vehicle we're driving. And that's why I can look at you and say you're perfect. Because this vehicle, yes, might be interesting to all these things going on, but what's inside that vehicle is always perfect. And that's the one that I would like you to know. That one. The one that's never busy, the one that's not got problems, the one that's not struggling. Because after all, you're not in control of that. This is, we might say, a divine essence coming through. So that idea of no one sees the wind, we only see how it is in the trees. We only see its movement in the clouds. And it's the same with this. We see its movements, we see what goes on, but we don't actually have a good grasp on the essential thisness, thusness. And that's the wonderful miracle that's worth spending most of your time looking at, exploring. The one that's beyond all of that thinking. So, I I, am... Quick wee bit about... My art, uh, I had my first work shown when I was seven. My father was a wonderful artist. Um, when I was about 13 or 14, got very troubled, was forced to wear women's clothes. It was very uncomfortable. <laughs> and became suicidally depressed, and my art stopped for years and years and years. A therapist later explained I had to kill that which was most precious in order to survive. So when I started in Zen practice, I started doing calligraphy, and straight away, there was the practice again that made the world disappear. Very important, whatever it is you do can be your focus. It doesn't have to be just sitting there staring at something. If you practice art, if you like to sew, anything like that can be your focus, bring you right here. So... I looked out the window and I was looking at the tree and I, that whole thing about the um, not being able to see the wind came to mind and I keep calligraphy supplies in my living room but there's no space to do the big pieces which I love to do. I want to do a dance piece with big pieces of calligraphy in it. Anyway. <laughs> so it was just coming through me and it was so it was I grabbed a, a little um, Japanese board, shikiki board, and um, instead of the usual I've been practicing Japanese and Chinese landscape painting because they fit on a board this size, unlike the calligraphy. And actually what started to happen was I mean I am not in charge. You know when you you discipline yourself for example in dance, but then if you have to be able to let go. And that's what happens with uh, when the art's good. It's not me doing art. And so it started to rip off the page. We can actually pass it around if you like. Or you can look at it. And uh, it was all about the motion of that which we cannot see. All about being able to experience that motion. And so it actually it's all ripped up and torn. And then the second one followed right on that one's heels. And this one was the wind as we can see it in the action of the trees. And this one came, turned out to be the wind, as we can see it in the action of the clouds. So um, I actually thought I'd love to do a whole workshop teaching around these, but I think I just did it. Um, <laughs> what made these rather poignant was, um, it still hasn't happened yet, but they were threatening to work on those windows and take the view away. And, uh, I realised I was holding on to those paintings because I think they're wonderful and <laughs> because it's the view. But this whole thing of the mystery, of being able to sit in the joy of that mystery, of not having to hold on tight to I know this and I know that and I know what's going to happen. And one of the best writers on this, of course, is Rumi, on the great mystery. Um, a hand up if you know Rumi. 
Oh, most people could. And you know, he was gay. You know, his most important relationships were uh, relationship with was with uh, Shams. And um, this is a fantastic collection if you like Rumi. This has got everything in it and some new stuff. And I've taught out of this this book so much it's kind of falling to pieces. Oh, there goes Alan Watts. Um, uh, the kind of correct term for this just being present, being able to stay present, is te, te. Um, just being here in, in, in this moment. So, oh dear me, do I have to stop at 11.30? No, 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 uh, we have a whole hour together. Ah, okay. Um, because I, 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 you know, as I say, I don't write these things, but I kind of fertilize the fields for a while before I just come and talk. And um, Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman, in the preface to Leaves of Grass, I'm sure I don't have to ask, does anyone know Walt Whitman? Um, he advises us, argue not concerning God. Re-examine all you have been told at church or school or in any book and dismiss whatever insults your soul. Which is exactly the same, I think, as the Buddha saying, be a lamp unto yourself. Take these things in, see how that goes, but if it's an insult to the soul. And um, because on, the uh, writer here is uh, Coleman Barks. He goes on to say, I say that the exclusivity of most of the organized religions in the world, world does insult the soul. And I absolutely agree with that. As you know, all the work I do on the streets is interfaith. Uh, I think there's n nothing worse. We've had so many wars over who's got it right. So there's nothing worse and no, no more great waste of time than arguing over who's got it right. And uh, once again, if you think you have it right, you're just going to hold on tighter to it. So... Um, if you don't want to hear Alan Watts on it, you can hear uh, <laughs> Whitman on it. Um, there are so many pieces in here that relate to what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, I guess we don't even have to look at books for this. I was coming here on the bus this morning, and two or three people got on going, Happy Easter, in fact, Happy Resurrection Day, Happy Resurrection Day. Happy Easter, and then someone stood and was in a loud voice telling us all why we should have hope because of what happened today. And um, some people were agreeing, some people were looking out the window. And um, I was very tempted to do that. <laughs> and start saying, every Good Friday it happens. And I just... And I'm just so tired of it, you know, so painful. But I, I have respect for everybody's religion, of course, so I didn't. Although I did start thinking, well, Easter, okay, so that's the goddess Oster. I could start talking about the origins, the pre-Christian origins of Easter. And how did you explain it? It's the, the, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox. Ah, ha, uh -huh. ha. And of course, um, when I told some of my friends I was talking on 420, um, they thought I was going to be talking about something else entirely. <laughs> you know. And so this is a tribute to the other 420. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, it's the only thing I have left. <laughs> anyway, I, as you know, as you can see, I mean, some people were reacting with anger to that, some people were enjoying it. Um, but can you, can you just listen to something like that and not get all you know, into reactive mode, not get into saying that you know better, you know? And this is, of course, we're talking about the larger picture. Can you do that with equanimity in everyday situations, you know? Can you use your sumpa, you're just coming back to this moment, to not keep reacting in the same old way. Because every time we react in the same old way, we're dragging something in from yesterday. Hmm. You know? I, as I say, I can say book, and that's peaceful. But if I start immediately, as you know, the way the mind works, form, the book, feelings. Oh, don't think I like that book. Perceptions, that's not a good book. 
formations. These books are never good. Consciousness, I always pick the wrong books. That's how it starts. So if we can stop it or leave it alone, that form, then that's much more peaceful. But of course it's practice. You have to keep practicing. And a simple thing like Sumpa that will bring you right back here, I would highly, highly recommend. So Rumi keeps shouting. Um, and there's so many great Rumi poems about this subject. How about, does anyone know the story about the elephant in the dark room? Do you know that story? The elephant in the dark room. Oh, it's a good one. Okay. Elephant in the dark. Some Hindus have an elephant to show, and no one here has ever seen an elephant. They bring it at night to a dark room. One by one we go in the dark and come out saying how we experience the animal. One of us happens to touch the trunk and says, it's a water pipe kind of creature. Another, the ear. Oh, it's a very strong, always moving back and forth, fan animal. <laughs> Another touches the leg. I find it to be still like the column of a temple. Another touches the curved back. It's a leathery throne. Another, the cleverest, feels the tusk. It's a rounded sword made of porcelain. He's proud of his description. <laughs> Each of us touches one place and understands the whole in that way. And actually this last part when I read this I thought of all of you and what we do when we're together. Um, because you know I love you all and it's just wonderful when we're together. And this says why. The palms and the fingers feeling in the dark are how the senses explore the reality of the elephant. If each of us held a candle there, and if we all went in together, we could see the whole elephant. Mm -hmm. Here he is again. Say I am you. I am dust particles in sunlight. I am the round sun. To the bits of dust I say, stay. To the sun I say, keep moving. I'm morning mist and the breathing of evening. I am wind in the top of a grove and surf on the cliff. Mast, rudder, helmsman and keel. I am also the coral reef they founder on. I'm a tree with a trained parrot in its branches. Silence, thought and voice, the musical air coming through a flute, a spark of a stone, a flickering in metal, both candle and the moth crazy around it, rose and the nightingale lost in fragrance. I am all orders of being, the circling galaxy, the evolutionary intelligence, the lift and the falling away. What is and what isn't? You who know, you, the one in all, say who I am. Say I am you. Wonderful, wonderful teaching he has. Mm. Mm. I, wish you were, I bet you wish you were reading these, they're great. <laughs> Anyway, I am... Um, oh, just one more. <laughs> I just can't resist. <sighs> this is my favourite. All day I think about it, then at night I say it. Where did I come from? And what am I supposed to be doing? I have no idea. My soul is from elsewhere, I'm sure of that, and I intend to end up there. This drunkenness began in some other tavern. When I get back around to that place, I'll be completely sober. Meanwhile, I'm like a bird from another continent, sitting in this aviary. The day is coming when I'll fly off. But who is it now in my ear who hears my voice? Who says words with my mouth? Who looks out with my eyes? What is the soul? I can't stop asking. 
If I could taste one sip of an answer, I could break out of this prison for drunks. I didn't come here of my own accord, and I can't leave that way. Whoever brought me here will have to take me home. <laughs> this poetry, I never know what I'm going to say. I don't plan it. When I'm outside the saying of it, I get very quiet and rarely speak at all. Okay, I'll stop, I promise. <laughs> Just one last one. <laughs> we are the mirror as well as the face in it. We are tasting the taste this minute of eternity. We are pain and what cures pain both. We are the sweet cold water and the jar that pours. So I just want to give everybody every encouragement to try to just stay right here, to try to be in the present and with each other and connected. And I would say one of the best practices for coming right here is to get away from being involved with all this blah, 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 blah. There's nothing wrong with other forms of meditation. You know, you can sit, you can relax with other forms. But nothing keeps you right here unless you have your eyes open and you're paying attention. Then you're ready and not attached. And I'm not talking, as I said earlier, about getting rid of thoughts or getting rid of emotions. What I find makes life so amusing is that old reactions still come up. You know, um, I talk often about muni, muni bus meditation because it can be so irritating, you know. And there was a guy the other day, I was sitting on that long seat and a guy came and sat near me. And it was after a long day, you know, I do I do a lot of work these days. And um, he started going, and he just went on and on and on. And then he started going, just, it was just awful, awful, awful. And I could see, you know, here's the reaction, you know, you want to say, shut the, you know, or, or it was nowhere to go on the bus that you could get away. And I was actually, I was sitting laughing at how violent I felt towards that man. And I actually had the thought went through my head, which is not me at all, but is it? It's sad, this is why I don't carry a gun. <laughs> and then, of course, I laughed at myself, you know. But that I, I do find that if you can just... It's not that you're going to suddenly instantly change, and you know. But if you can come to this perfect one, the one who's in here driving this, this vehicle, and put your, put your mind there, put your attention there, and don't worry so much about all the rest of it. You know, one of my favourite sayings, don't worry what people think, they don't do it that often. <laughs> <laughs> Just being able gently, kindly to be with your perfect self right here. And I bet there's a lot of people sitting here going, I'm not perfect. <laughs> but you are. And you can discover that for yourself. If you can practice Staying here, staying present. Oh, well, I could read five more, but I think we'll. Uh, I would love to have a bit of time for any questions, answers, comments, and these are available <laughs> by donation if anyone is interested. I kept on and on holding on to them because I just think they're wonderful. But you know, that's holding on, and I, I sometimes have a wee bar bad habit of that. Uh, my father was the same holding on to old memories and so forth. When my father died, he had the ticket to my college graduation in his pocket. Mm -hmm. And that had been about ten years before. So he, you know, so I have a bit of that habit. So there they are, and if anyone would like them, please feel free. Um, they're called a, a tribute to Seshu. Uh, and I won't do that again, raise your hand if you know Seshu. But Seshu is a wonderful um, landscape painter in there. Anyway, so any questions, comments, more points?
Uh, yeah, I hate to be to uh, barge in and be the first to ask or to comment, but uh, I think this are magnificent and uh, have an extra special meaning for me as a meteorology uh, and as a meteorology professor. Oh, yeah. Wanted to make a comment about clouds because you're talking about, about them about their their insubstantial nature. I mean, they're being you see the uh, the, the wind as being invisible on the clouds as being a visible manifestation of it. But even the clouds are not what they appear to be. They're not entities. Uh, within a cloud, there's an updraft. There's air going up. And there's little uh, droplets of invisible, but many of them, that form and dissipate. So things are going right through it. Uh, all of these invisible processes are taking place. And uh, anyway, it's uh, and another comment as a scientist, too, there's uh, this program, I don't know if anybody has seen it, Cosmos, that I just began looking at it, I'm, I'm a few weeks late, but it really conveys the, the mystical excitement behind the discoveries, you know, the scientific process. And yeah. It's available to us in all these different forms, but so opaque yeah. in the way that it is conveyed. Exactly, that's why... I'm out on the streets talking normally. I mean, I don't dress like this or anything. I did this for you. I mean, I don't <laughs> talk about it even as Buddhism or religion. In fact, with the maintenance workers the other day, I talked about the neuroscience that we were, we were um, working with. There's a great book called The Buddha's Brain. It's all about the neuroscience of what we do. It's not woo-woo. It's not esoteric. I will say things like that. And the maintenance guys, I said... What we're talking about is neurons that fire together, wire together. So if, for example, every time I see a picture of that woman, I, oh, I don't like her. Then every time I see it, I'll think, oh, I don't like her. And that's the neurons firing together and wiring together. If I encounter that image and deliberately think of something more pleasant, then I'm setting up a new neural pathway. So that eventually what happens is that becomes your way. So there's nothing, as I say, as a tech, this is science, what we are doing, what I was talking about, Sumpa, call it feeling your breath, it doesn't matter. Um, eventually, if you deliberately replace the negative with the positive, which is just an interesting practice, your, bra your neurons will fire up that pathway, and that will be your new neural pathway, not the miserable suffering one. <coughs> so you may think that what I'm talking about is just getting a wee bit of peace of mind right now. But in actual fact, what we're doing is scientifically rewiring our brains so on into the future. Every time we do that, we create a new positive neural pathways. And that's how, you know, they, they say in the teachings, this is not learning meditation. This is simply the Dharma gate of repose and bliss. And it's not just right now. It's going on. But thank you for that about the, everything's like that. Everything's on the horizon in this moment. Absolutely everything is going on. Thank you, John. Uh, it's refreshing to hear Bruce talk about the ephemeral, like divine essence, or who's driving the spirit core, or what moves the trees. And, uh, how do you, I have no problem with that, or the G word for that matter. How do you uh, reconcile that with uh, all the emphasis on anatta or no self? Well, the thing is, uh, we have to remember good old Nagarjuna, if we want to get into this. Nagarjuna, he's called Nagarjuna because he got the teachings from the water dragons. <laughs> Very scientific. Um, yes, there is no self. There is no intrinsic self. I'm only here. Everybody who's looking at me is perceiving a different thing, and you know this is a very you know ephemeral kind of thing. And there is a self. Here I am. So you have to be able to hold both things. And why I mention Nagara Junior is because he has four ways. There is, there isn't, there is neither, and there is both. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Tibetans, of course, have a wonderful way of asking you about the self. You know, point to yourself. No, that's your chest. <laughs> no, that's your head. You can't, you know. So, yes, holding it lightly, but there is and there isn't. Um, and I think that that's what 
I'm talking about his fixed views. You know, if I say there is, ah, now I've got it right, you know, no, there is, I mean, that's, you just, whenever you develop a fixed view, you're setting yourself up against something else. So the basic teaching is non-dualism. So how can you hold on to fixed views? Because that's creating opposites, creating enemies. So you were speaking about Buddha's brain and you know neurons that fire together and all yeah. that. And it reminded me, I came across a practice recently um, where any time a thought arises, which most are negative, critical, you know, self-deprecating, or worrying about the future and <coughs> you know, thinking about the past. But every time we catch that is to just say, I love myself. Mm. And it's really interesting because it just, everything else falls away, and at the same time, it's also creating this, you know, this new, stronger neural pathway of self-acceptance, self-appreciation, self-love, which here in the West, we're not very good at. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. But, I mean, doing that with love is just so beautiful. I, I had come up, my, often new methods come flying in from funny places. And I got a new one recently to remind myself that when I'm all caught up, remember that, that remember back here. And um, in fact, I think Misaki would probably remember it. She could probably tell you it. Misaki sits with me on a Monday night. <laughs> um, I was watching Batman, one of my favourite, favourite shows. Uh, it's the most camp show in the world. It's fantastic. And um, the narrator, so there was Batman and Robin were up there doing something in the living room and then the, the bad guys were down in the basement doing something in the basement. Now stop that, I can hear what you're thinking. <laughs> Another advantage of staying in the moment. Anyway, um, so the narrator so he kept, you know, describes Batman and Robin and then he goes, meanwhile, in the basement... And then he talks about what's going on in the basement. And then he goes, meanwhile, in the living room, Batman and Robin. And then a few minutes, meanwhile, in the basement. And I just started to laugh because it was so, meanwhile, back in the living room. And he did it six times and I was sitting giggling. And then I thought, well, that's that over. And then he left it go by a wee bit longer. And then he went, meanwhile. And so I, I thought it was so funny. And as you know, humor, I love, you know, it comes up all the time. And you can't stress and laugh at the same time. So I've started using that one. If I find myself, I was sitting thinking about a problem with someone the other morning, and what could I do, how could I make him understand, and could I do this? And then suddenly through my mind went, meanwhile, <laughs> oh, here I am, I'm back here again. So that's another good one. <laughs> See, we've all got that wisdom. We've all got that wisdom. Anybody else? Okay. Yes? I would like to make a comment on yes. the, the first thing that you shared with us. Yes. Um, I grew up in Hawaii um, on Big Island where there's a lot of massive wind. So a lot of trees actually grow like benthos. Yeah. So my uh, school, I guess mascot for like all the competitive sports was the strong wind and it was the, the, the image bench. of the tree. Ah. <laughs> and I thought it was kind of weird first strong wind tree, but uh, um, I realized that a lot of people saw it differently. Um, some people see it as a symbol of strength against uh, holding onto you know, the ground without being torn down by wind. Some other people saw it as the flexibility of mm. the tree that makes it strong, um, or combined with both. Is that sort of like the essence of the Zen art that you you do, or you incorporate art in practice, uh, or calligraphy in practice? Is that sort of like a something that could mean like completely opposite things? Could well, the thing is, I mean, the meaning is always in who's looking at it. You know, and that was a wonderful example. Thank yeah. you. You know. Um, in Scotland, there's a lot of trees like that as well <laughs> on the coast that are permanently yeah. bent sideways. Um, I, 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 as I say, I don't control this when I'm doing it. So I don't know... I mean, who's, say, who's speaking these words? You know, who are you listening to? What is this? 
And that's the wonderful mystery. So my answer is I don't know. That's great. <laughs> I just know that with um, the calligraphy, you know, there's a discipline in, in every practice. The calligraphy, you copy, 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 copy for years, and then sometimes some style of its own emerges. And that was the same with this. I was busy for a long time copying Chinese and Japanese landscapes. And then I kind of looked out the window and I thought, well, I'd like to do this with this beauty and its emphasis on nature. There's hardly ever people in these pictures, in the landscape paintings. If they are, they're like that big, you know. Um, and now I've completely lost the thread of what I was saying. <laughs> what was I saying? Thank you. This is this why you have to have at least one young, young student, you see. <laughs> I've still got a break. <laughs> so I was doing the copy, 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 and then I thought I want it to be San Francisco. I want it to express it here, uh, not some you know Japanese or Chinese representation of. So I copy, 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 and then that is what came through on its own, that, which is kind of traditional but really not at all um, there's an awful lot, I'd love to offer a workshop sometime, I'm looking for a venue um, on self acceptance um, which I love to teach through calligraphy because um, you know it's our, it's our funny little raggedy bits that make us unique you know, it's not a perfect thing you know. but the energy through it is Anyway, any other? Well, I just want to. Yes. I was going to ask this, but since nobody else is asking, um, what is your alternative to the to the tape red? Like the, po the population that you work with? Or yes. Population that is Very people. good question. And the last thing you want to do is take it. Right. Uh, yeah. Even though I made it very down to earth and talked about it as science, and you know, I realised that not everybody is going. To, in actual fact, I remember when I first started trying to find the breath and stay with it. It's actually really quite challenging. They wanted three minutes of that at three, and I, I said, let's start with. That's why I said, let's just start with three breaths. You know, instead of three minutes of doing something. Um, but I realised that. Um, that's not always easy. So I, I had decided to do the breath because that was traditional. And then the other one, I wanted to be completely physical and in the body. So that one, I, the second one I told them was simply feeling where your body is touching the floor or your chair, you know, so that it's very, very physical. And that one you can do while you're walking because that's your feet on the ground. And then I realised I still probably wasn't reaching everybody. You can't reach 100% of people, you know. But I thought one last thing just came as, a, a, as an inspiration. And I pulled out a, a pack of Tic Tac mints and put them on the table. And I said, one of those will last you about three minutes. <laughs> because I, 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 like the women in the shelter that I work with, they're not going to sit. I mean, the poor people are coming off meth and things like that. They're not going to just sit there with their breath. So in, in working with the women in the shelter, it's all people in recovery. I do things like can of soda meditation, where you, for example, get a cold soda and hold it. So you can use all of your senses. You've got the touch. You can hear it fizzing. You can, you know, you can taste it, might smell nice, you know, you can... And that's a really powerful way to stay right here. So basically I tell people it's what I was right in front of them. You know. that, that kind of soda one, that led a, a woman I was working with to be able to be comfortable enough to go back f 40 years in her thinking, which she'd never been able to do before because she kept getting upset. And to figure out why she'd been stealing dresses for 40 years. It was very interesting. But she couldn't get there before because, as you know, if you start talking about upsetting things, you can get knocked off. But because she could keep refocusing on the can of soda, she could, you know. So whatever's right there. It didn't have to be something special. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank Since you. There's a couple minutes left. Can you share a couple special 
Oh, well, do we have a couple we, of minutes? Yes, do we have time for a cup of tea? After we have, that? Um, what, yeah, nine minutes to be precise. So. For a cup of tea? <laughs> That's not going to be enough well, time for a cup of tea. Right after oh. well, well, you're still I like, thought we all had to run out the door at noon. No, 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 12 30. Oh, well, I could have gone on much longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Scottish, I can talk forever. <clears throat> In fact, if anybody has any questions, they don't even have to be about this. And so many, I don't know why, but so many of these made me think of you guys. They just... How about only breath? Only breath, that's a good one. And this one I do when I'm working with... Um, people of different faiths, like maybe priests, ministers. For example, a few months ago I had 50 people from the Pacific School of Religion and they wanted to talk about how do you do memorials. But their question was, how, how do you do memorials without mentioning God? And I explained that I provided whatever was appropriate for the people there. If the person had been Jewish, I carry the Kaddish, you know what I mean? And if they're not godly at all, then I don't particularly mention God. You know. um, and the, the two other priests that were on the panel with me, um, I turned to them and said, well, can you do a memorial without mentioning God if, if the person doesn't want a mention of God, if, they, if it's not appropriate? And one of them turned and went, well, we try, but you know, he just sneaks in, doesn't he? <laughs> 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 so, funnily enough, he doesn't just sneak in when I'm talking. <laughs> I haven't noticed it. Any. So, this is a good one for the, for this kind of uh, folks. Not Christian or Jew or Muslim, not Hindu, not Buddhist, not Sufi or Zen, not any religion or cultural system. I'm not from the east or the west, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal, not composed of elements at all. And in answer to your question, I do not exist. <laughs> I'm not an entity in this world or the next, did not descend from Adam or Eve or any origin story. My place is placeless, a trace of the traceless neither body or soul. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one, and that one call to and know, first, last, outer, inner, only that breath, breathing, human being. You know, what makes him so glorious is that it's love poetry, um, because you are perfect, because you are just perfect the way you are, I, if I want to use the word God, I see God right there, I see it right there, right there, right there, right here, right there, right there, right there, right there. So when he addresses God, he's addressing that and he's addressing his great love, Shams. So you can't tell the difference in his ecstatic love poetry. Is he writing that to his lover or to God? Or is that the same thing? And that, to me, is what makes his his poetry so absolutely beautiful. Some of them are, are kind of directly erotic, I find. Um, if you have a look through the books, you'll find some of them are just... Here's the one that I used to have on my first business card. And this, of course, appealed to my sense of humour, too. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. See, I thought that was good for business. <laughs> <laughs> Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. Beautiful, beautiful love poetry. Okay, one more and then I'll stop. The breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. 
Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds meet. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. So please, don't go back to sleep. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jana. Thank you. And I, I, I'll just add, I do have three sit-ins a week that everybody's welcome to. And uh, um, they're on the website. They're on your website. Yeah. And your website, again, uh, janadraka.com. Easy, easy. 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 <laughs> <laughs> as long as you can spell it right. Uh, uh, two Ks. Two Ks on the drag. Yes, yes. Not well, three. three. Luckily, not three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> A little time lag in those more inspiring. <laughs> I don't know where they come from. <laughs> so again, thank you very much. Uh, you. And uh, at this point, you know, we we'll make a few announcements. So let me start with our standard announcement that uh, we do at this point, uh, which is about uh, Donna, uh, which is uh, the Pali word uh, for generosity and giving. Uh, and uh, we have a Donna bowl out there, uh, and we would like, yeah, if you can afford it, uh, for a donation of ten dollars or more to support the various activities that we, we have uh, in the Sangha, including the rent for this room, the, uh, the newsletter production costs, uh, mailing costs, uh, Larkin Street Youth Center dinner that uh, happens once a month. And if you want to see an itemized breakdown uh, of the, our expenses, it's out there uh, on the counter. Uh, so that uh, our host will be coming around with a, with a down a bowl uh, when we have the next half hour. The session, and hopefully you will stay at Jana for oh, the next half hour. Hey, free cup of tea. We'd love to hang out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we have a host, uh, David. Right? Yes, um, I'm your host. Um, there's some fruit, and there's some homemade bread. Kind of has uh, walnut, raisins, bananas. We didn't have enough bananas, and we had some apples. And of course, there's sugar in it. So it's okay. <laughs> Um, if you do opt to have some tea, if you could just drop, um, gently place your cup in the sink in the soapy water, mm -hmm. and in order to save water, I'll wash them all at the same time. So I'll please just get it into the sink, and I'll be coming around for Donna Bowl. And lastly, um, there is on the credenza to your right, there's a sign up sheet if you'd like to get on GBS. Uh, mailing list um, electronically, and then about 12:30, uh, a number of us uh, will be waiting out front, and we all typically pick a really great restaurant to eat um, close by, and it's a great way to meet other members of the sangha. Thank you. And our speaker next week will be David Lewis, former sangha member, uh, and he will be talking about the third of the three aspects of Buddhism, um, anatta. No self, so very appropriate uh, follow up to what we have. Oh, somebody's about. got to read Nagarjuna and bring that up. <laughs> so, uh, are there any other announcements? Yeah. At the uh, Sahara Zen Mountain Center on June 1st to June 5th, there will be uh, an LGBTQIAA <laughs> <laughs> retreat that will be uh, led by Tova Green. Adam and I will be there, and uh, a number of other people will be there. If you're interested in finding out about Pasahara, don't ask me. I've never been there. Um, <laughs> and the dates again? What was that? The dates? June 1st to June 5th. And I have some flyers if anybody's interested. And so, I, I lived there for many years so if anybody Johnny, wants to yeah, and ask Tom questions. Yeah, will be the uh, teacher of that uh, Any other announcements? If not, uh, let's do our dedication of merits. Uh. Okay, trying to be gentle is really doing her. It wasn't just a joke. <laughs> By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. 
May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow, and may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.